Would I be the antagonist if I told my mom that I'm uncomfortable with someone touching me, even though I know they're disabled? For context, around a year ago, my 17-year-old female family moved house to a pretty small town and now live down the road from a residential home for disabled people. I want to say before I begin that I'm asking this genuinely because I don't want to be a bleast. I'm autistic myself and would never want to make someone else feel upset or ashamed for something they cannot control. It started few months ago when I was walking to school. This man, let's call him Mark, not his real name, I also don't know how old Mark is, and his caregiver were walking the opposite direction on the pavement so I moved out of the way for them. They thanked me and that was that. We started to bump into each other more often after that interaction due to us living on the same road, and it became a routine for Mark to fist bump me every time we saw each other and ask me how school was going, how I was, etc. He also actively spoke to my mum, 43-year-old female, whenever he saw her and would ask about me. There had only been one time where I felt uncomfortable, and was visibly so, during an interaction, because his caregiver made him apologize to me the next time I saw him. As well as another time where I got home shaking and on the verge of tears because he started screaming and yelling at me, quite aggressively, from across the road to get my attention. Other than those few times, it was pretty consist small interactions for about nine months until things started to shift last month. A few weeks ago, my mum expressed to me about how she felt mildly frustrated with being stopped by Mark to talk about me when she was in a rush to get to work and stuff. She said this to me as we were leaving the house together, she was going to work, I was going to the shop to buy snacks. When we were walking down the road, we ran into Mark. My mum tried to make the conversation go as fast as possible and during it, she made a comment about how I was in a very bad mood. I was on my period and grumpy so she wasn't lying, in hopes that it would result in him leaving me alone for the rest of the day. I managed to get away from the conversation and to the shop. However, whilst I was checking out, Mark came in and came up behind me. He proceeded to hug me from behind and said, Don't be moody. I really really like you, okay? While I just stood there and froze because I didn't expect it. The cashier seemed to notice that I was uncomfortable, and she seemed uncomfortable too. I felt really guilty for being uncomfortable because I know he probably didn't realize it. Ever since then he has started to go in for a hug every time he sees me and keeps touching me more often. His hands sometimes linger on my lower back. I have problems with people I know touching my lower back due to issues from a past relationship, so it feels worse when someone I barely know starts doing it. Yet, I feel like I'm being dramatic and overreacting so I don't know what to do. Would I be the asshole if I told my mom? Talk to the caregiver. He needs to not be touching you. Do you have an age guess for Mark? Also, absolutely tell your mom I'm sick and don't want to get you sick, so no hugs. Whether he is disabled or not, whether he is aware of what he is doing or not, it doesn't matter. You have the right to refuse to be touched, and you must not let it happen out of charity. If Mark is not aware of what he is doing and always seems to be accompanied by his caregiver, you talk to her about it. His caregiver and group home administrator need to know his behavior is escalating. Am I the antagonist for wanting my husband to sell his house for more money? My spouse and I were married in August and moved in together then. He owns a house that he was living in and now rents out. The home is 1.5 hours from where we live now. It's been hard for him to afford to keep it. His taxes and insurance went up and he realized he is actually losing $200 a month on the house. He tried to raise the rent $200 a month so that he could break even, but the tenant decided to move out since he could not afford it. He originally had a six-month lease, so the rent would have been raised as of next month. He started floating the idea of selling it. He doesn't want to find new tenants and he'd rather just be done with it. His aunt found out he was considering selling it and offered him $140,000 for it. He immediately said yes with no research into what it could be worth. Houses in his neighborhood rarely come up for sale. There's only been three that have sold in the past year. I asked him to get the home appraised and he said no. He accepted his aunt's offer and that was that. I ended up paying for an appraisal because I was sure it was worth more. The appraisal came back at $185,000. I also did a walkthrough with a realtor who said it could incite a bidding war since it was so rare for houses to sell there. This house has been in his family for almost 70 years and a lot of neighbors have similar stories. I asked him to talk to his aunt and try to negotiate a better price. I suggested maybe they can meet in the middle somewhere. He told me to mind my own business, that's it's a done deal, and that he didn't want to price gouge family. I understand wanting to give his aunt a good deal, but potentially missing out on an extra $30,000 is ridiculous to me. His aunt is in her mid-80s and probably will only live another few years. Then her children will sell the house for an amazing profit. Why shouldn't we try to make a profit too? Within reason? I suggested he ask his aunt for $160,000 or list it on the market. My spouse didn't inherit the house. He bought it from his grandparents for full appraisal value. He still owes $90,000 on the house. He is flat out refusing to renegotiate and said I'm too money hungry. Last year my spouse barely made $30,000 at work so we could potentially get another year's salary with the sale. I entirely support us right now, paying for our health insurance, mortgage, groceries, etc. He spends his money on his car payment, cell phone bill, house and weed cigarettes energy drinks. 
I've tried to get him to cut down on the vices and explain to him how much money he spends on them, but he doesn't really listen. We calculated it and he spends about $700 a month on the vices. I'm sick of supporting us and need him to contribute more. Before we got married, he agreed to pay $1,000 a month towards our expenses. In the six months we've been married, he's maybe paid $1,000 total. So am I the jerk for wanting him to sell closer to market value? Dump your husband and let him live in his house, as anyone who earns only $30,000 a year cannot afford to spend $700 per month on vices. Why are you supporting his lifestyle when you'd be financially better off without him? Am I the antagonist for telling my sisters that they are not allowed to see my child again? I, 29 years old female, have two siblings, Kara, 26 years old female, and Lois, 23 years old female. I also have a daughter, 8 years old female, who we will call V. Me and my sisters have all been pretty close. We had done everything together when we were younger. As for my daughter, she hates being alone. Ever since her father passed, she clung to my side for a long time before she started to become more independent. Yesterday, I took V to see her grandparents for lunch. My sisters live with our parents since they both don't have a stable job. When I arrived at my parents' house, Lois greeted us at the door. I asked her where our parents were, and she said that they had gone to the grocery store. She said that she could take care of V until they came back. I agreed since Lois and Kara had both babysat V many times for some easy cash. I left and called my parents to let them know what I had done. I left to go do some errands. When I finished with everything, and as I was heading back to my parents' house, Kara called me. She said that V is being a brat, and I need to come get her now. I rushed over there and saw my parents yelling at my sisters and my daughter on the porch crying. I went over to them and asked them what happened. My mom started explaining that my sisters left the house while I was gone and left V alone in the house. Thankfully, she was only in there for about 45 minutes before my parents came home. I was livid. I picked up my daughter and yelled at my sisters that they were not allowed to see me or my kid again. Kara had started saying that it was unfair and that V was old enough to be by herself. Lois was trying to say something but I wasn't listening. I left in my car while they were arguing and went home. When I got home I talked with my daughter about what had happened and asked her if they had done this before. She said that they hadn't done this before except for this one time, but they were only gone for two minutes. I hugged my daughter and told her that we would never see her aunts again. My daughter started sobbing, screaming that it was only a mistake and that she loved her aunties. I didn't know how to explain anymore, so I told her to have a little nap. When I checked my phone I got 12 missed calls from my sisters with many texts. I didn't read any nor call them back. After V sobbing I feel guilty, but I think I'm doing the right thing. My parents believe that what they did was horrible, but we are family so we shouldn't cut contact. So, am I the asshole? I think you handled the situation poorly in telling your daughter she would never see her aunts again. It's important to communicate effectively with her in times of distress. Yes, what your sisters did was reckless and they shouldn't be trusted for childcare, but cutting contact seems extreme. You can still have a relationship with boundaries in place. Overall, I think you're the antagonist for the way you handled the situation. Am I the antagonist for telling off my future mother-in-law? My fiancé, 22 male and I, 25 female, are getting married. His mom started being extremely difficult when we announced. We visit his family in November and she is not friendly with me at all. Spends hours in her room with a headache. Repeatedly and emotionally tells us that we must spend at least one holiday per year with them now, as it's only fair, and alluding that she was hurt, we didn't spend any this year. Two weeks after returning home, we get a video call from her and fiancé's entire family telling us that she needs to have a religious ceremony take place involving her and her recently deceased mother by proxy. And the day before our wedding is going to be the best time for that. Mind you, this wedding is going to be out of town and so the few days before are going to be busy putting things together. But anyhow, fiancé looks at me to make the decision. I feel like I can't say no. Mother-in-law is being very emotional. I try to convey the day before our wedding is going to be busy so this is not ideal, and if they must do it please plan in the morning as we have a lot to do later in the day. We get a text from his mom a month later saying she scheduled it for the late afternoon, because that's the only time available. She then also tried to invite 5 extra people to our less than 50 person wedding. Was told no two times, then third time sicked her daughter on us to tell us we needed to make up our minds whether or not they could invite those people. We were honestly dumbfounded. Fiancé calls her and says no, she cannot invite these people we don't even know to our tiny intimate wedding and to stop asking. She cries on the phone but the tears clear up immediately when the topic changes. She mentions that she is going to be upset if I have more people from my side of the family than she does at the wedding. She never sent us addresses from her family despite us asking at least three times. And then when that didn't go over, said she feels really left out of the wedding and like she wants to feel more apart than she does. Last week we were making scheduling plans and we realized the time she has set for her ceremony is the only time we can get our photos done. We let her know, and suddenly she is very keen to check if they have a morning slot available and surprise, they do. Fiancé tells her he will talk to me about it because it's still going to be very busy the day before our wedding. She calls both of us anyway and basically puts me on the spot. 
She starts getting hostile, and I am unwilling to negotiate at this point and tell her neither her son or I will be able to make it, and it doesn't matter what time it will be. It is the day before our wedding and preparing for it is more important than her ceremony. She starts crying saying how important it is for her family to be together during this ceremony. I say I'm sorry, but the wedding has to take priority. His family is pissed at me for not being flexible on this and with the people we said couldn't come to the wedding. Am I the a hole here? Not the antagonist for standing your ground and saying no to your future mother-in-law's unreasonable demands. It's not your responsibility to navigate these difficult situations. Your fiancé should be the one handling their own family issues. Your wedding is about you and your fiancé, not her and her deceased mother. Set boundaries now before the behavior worsens in the future. I do not trust my husband after having a baby. I, 30 years old female, cannot trust my husband, 32 years old male, after having a baby. My husband completely withdrew from our baby and me right after I gave birth. I did everything myself. I had horrible postpartum anxiety postpartum depression because I was burnt out and felt completely alone and rejected. I threatened divorce and to file for full custody of our child. I had receipts to prove I paid for everything and texts from him that proved he was being neglectful. I had every right not to trust him with our child. He didn't go to therapy but he agreed he probably had postpartum depression and would work on adjusting to his new life as a father. It has been a little over a year, and he has improved drastically as far as being a father. I trust him with our child now completely. Now that he has resolved his issues with parenting, we are wanting to improve our relationship. I guess while I was recovering from postpartum anxiety postpartum depression myself, it pushed me far away from him. I don't trust him to take care of me or comfort me. Nor do I want to go to him for any emotional support. We have turned into roommates and prefer to spend time apart. This has been bothering him, not me so much, and he wants to work on intimacy and rekindling our relationship. I agreed to try to work on our relationship, but I found I'm just not interested in him anymore. I don't want to put in any effort into our marriage. This frustrates him, and in return makes him want to work even less. What concerns me is I just don't care. The biggest thing for me in a relationship is emotional security and I don't have that with him. I don't want to allow myself to open up to him again out of fear he'll hurt or abandon me again. We are now at a stalemate. We have talked about this issue a few times, and it ends in a heated argument, and very little has changed. Every time I try and talk to him about postpartum anxiety, postpartum depression and how it almost took my life, I feel like he brushes it under the rug. I feel like he doesn't see how seriously ill I was during that time. He definitely doesn't see how he contributed to that pain. This also hurts me because I think I'll only have one child. That is not what I wanted, but I don't think I could ever have another baby with him. This also contributes to me not wanting to put in any effort. I just got in with a therapist and my first appointment is coming soon. Since we have opened this Pandora's box, I have been emotionally unwell. I obviously haven't addressed my issues fully, but I am looking forward to therapy. I can't wait to have a safe place to get this all out and feel heard. Has anyone else gone through this and how did you get through this? Should I let down my guard and trust him again, or should he be the one actively working to regain my trust? Or should I cut him slack because we were both going through the trenches and he just couldn't handle it? It's concerning that he doesn't acknowledge the hurt or the seriousness of what you went through, especially with PPD almost taking your life. Without understanding his impact on you, it's hard to see how trust can be rebuilt. It's wild that he still dismisses your trauma despite everything. Dismissing health struggles, mental or physical, is a major red flag for me. If I can't trust you when I'm sick, then how can I trust you in any situation? Therapy may be necessary for progress. There will be no dirt on your tires. So I have worked at an outdoor retail store for a little over two years now. The employee turnover rate at my job is pretty high, with most only lasting a few months. Thus, I have become one of the more knowledgeable and employees, and I work primarily in the bike shop. Now, the bike shop manager also happens to be head bike tech, meaning he is often busy repairing and building bikes. He has taken a liking to me and as such, I do most of the part ordering, repair check-ins, and restocking and merchandising of the department floor. One of the few employees who has been working longer than me bought himself a brand new fat bike last spring. He lives in a small apartment, and so he stores his bike at the shop, as the bike shop manager and store owner allow. However, it is meant to be stored in the warehouse, not on the shop floor itself. Well, one day we got a large order of bikes that we wanted to put on the floor. I went and asked this employee if he could move his bike to the warehouse, or if I could for him. He told me, yes, you can bring it to the warehouse, but I don't want dirt on the tires. It needs to stay shiny and clean for the winter. Also, please put it in a corner or something where it won't get dinged or scratched. Well, I am a kind and accommodating coworker. however, I don't fancy having to carry this large bike the 500 feet or so to the warehouse. So I decided that I'd make sure that no one would scratch his bike. In our warehouse, half of it is dedicated to backstock, and the other half has our paddle sports department. In the backstock side, half of that is large shelves like you'd see at Costco or other large grocery stores, and the other is bike racks for our stock that won't fit on the floor. The top of these shelves are usually left empty as we don't have a forklift, 
and there usually isn't enough merchandise to facilitate needing that extra space. This open space 20 feet off the ground is where my malicious compliance took place. Carefully I climbed the ladder to the top of the shelf carrying his bike on my back. Once up there I carefully tied it to the post that was left up there and stood it up on some cardboard boxes so as to not dirty the tires. I then climbed down and moved the ladder. I then continued about my work and finished the merchandising. My bike shop manager has a great sense of humor, and so when he went to the warehouse to grab a bike in for repairs, he about lost it when he saw what I had done with the bike. He came back into the store laughing his head off and agreed that his was a justly earned prank. My coworker who owned the bike, on the other hand, did not find it quite as funny. He is shorter than me and so he could not reach high enough when on top of the ladder to get it down. When I left in the fall for school, it was still up there, and I imagine he will have had to get another co-worker to get it down for him. Legend has it, his bike is still up there amidst his dedication to keeping the tires clean. If he doesn't like dirt on the tires, how does he manage to ride around without getting them dirty? It's like buying diving equipment and not wanting it to get wet. A true feat of determination. Thanks for watching. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. To finish listening to all the stories, check out the playlist in the description.